Hi everyone, welcome to this M2D to talk today. Um, it's been a while since we didn't have one. Um, yeah, we took some time to reflect on how to make the talk series better. And yeah, I'm pleased that one of the change that we're implementing is today is, have a, is to have a co-host and the co-host that will be joining me from now on is Emmanuel Benjio. Um, who is a scientist at Valence Lab, previously has his PhD um, from Miller. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure. Yeah, I think he's also known as the godfather of GFONET, but that's the story for the day. So <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you so much, Emmanuel, for um, yeah, co-hosting this with, with me uh, from now on. And yeah, I will let you, let you introduce yourself and yeah, and take on from here. Yeah, thanks. That's a new one, Godfather of GFLNets. Um, so yeah, scientist at Leon Labs. I work on uh, de novo design with generative models of graphs and, and similar stuff. Um, so it's really a pleasure to be co-hosting M2D2. Uh, it's been a wonderful community to learn and, and exchange. Um, so yeah, uh, our speaker today is Reza. And he is a PhD student in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at uh, Eidhoven University of Technology, and he's currently supervised by Francesca Grizzoni at the Molecular ML Group. Uh, and yeah, I'll give you the mic. Thanks, Eza. Yeah, thanks, uh, Emmanuel, uh, for, for the introduction. And thanks, uh, thank, thank, I thank the whole team for inviting me here to present my research. Today, I, uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, our latest research for the Nova design, which uses a new deep learning architecture called structure state, uh, state space sequence, sequences, and, yeah, and how we implement uh, chemical language uh, models uh, using this uh, new architecture. But before diving into the details of what we do and what we found, let me uh, first uh, broadly motivate why we need uh, such, such models. Uh, the answer is actually hidden in the vastness of the chemical space. Chemical space, uh, as we define it, the set of all possible drug-like synthesizable molecule, molecules is estimated to contain 10 to the power of 60 uh, compounds. So this sounds like a very large number. And to give you an idea of how large of a number it is, the number of stars in the observable universe is only around 10 to the 27. So yes, 10 to the 60 is a very large number. And we cannot simply test all possible molecules in this space in the lab. So we need some uh, computational methods to guide our search and to find molecules with desired properties uh, faster. Uh, one idea that has uh, been particularly useful uh, in actually the novel design uh, of molecules with bespoke properties, it is inspired from natural language and language modeling. If you're unfamiliar with language modeling, let me uh, uh, tell you what it is with an example. Language modeling is basically uh, the task of predicting the next word in a sentence, let's say. And that's exactly what your smart keyboards do, for instance. Assume you're typing uh, in your smart keyboard and you typed I, and then your keyboard would uh, generate uh, some uh, recommendations for you, like I, I am, it is. So it will predict the next element uh, in the sequence. And then uh, you will just select one and then it will give you another uh, set of recommendations. And then again, this is called language modeling. So this same idea is actually, uh, can be used uh, to generate molecules as if you're generating uh, sentences. And to do that uh, and to uh, strengthen the tie uh, with the natural language, we actually represent molecules as text. We have a, a textual representation called Simplified Molecular Input Line System, or SMILES in short, that can basically encode the molecular graph without any information loss uh, as a text. So given this molecular graph of caffeine, for instance, you can generate a SMILE string that encodes the same information as the molecular graph using some uh, special syntax. And once you have such a representation, then you can actually generate molecules as if you are typing. For instance, assume you have this uh, molecular keyboard that would just predict the next element or the first element as carbon, and then you will type carbon and then it will give you more suggestions like a nitrogen and a ring. 
and then another carbon, and then you will keep uh, yeah, generating the next tokens, and then you will get this uh, lovely molecule caffeine back, like our uh, source of energy uh, yeah, in, in very long nights, uh, let's say. Okay, and this is uh, called chemical language modeling. So yeah, you're not modeling the natural language, but you're modeling a chemical language that is actually uh, formed by those smile strings. But then the question is, how do you get? How, how do you get there? How do you have those uh, molecular keyboards, molecular generators? Let's say there is like a very uh, typical pipeline. Uh, let's say so. You first uh, curate uh, a very large uh, collection of molecules, a, a, a collection of generic molecules with, uh, yeah, with no specific property in, in, at at this stage, like the molecules in in Campbell. And then you throw a, a, a sequence model on top of it. And sequence models, if you're unfamiliar with them, they're a, a type of a generative, uh, they're, they're a type of deep learning architecture that can process inputs as sequences and also give sequences as output. So they, uh, they take sequences as input and give sequences as output. They can process sequences. And then once you train the sequence model on those uh, collection of molecules, you can uh, start generating. Then in this pipeline, actually, what you put here in the middle as the sequence model is very important because it is the component of this pipeline that is responsible uh, to capture uh, the chemistry encoded or capture the properties encoded is in this large collection and then also uh, to mimic it uh, during generation time. So you, it should be able to capture and generate, uh, yeah, capture properties and generate uh, molecules with uh, bespoke properties again. And of course, there has been a lot of research uh, that uh, put into this. And a very popular choice uh, in the last decade, which was also val validated in numerous wet lab studies, uh, has been long short term memory networks or LSTMs in short. How LSTMs work uh, in general, given a small string, they process the input from left to right one by one. And at each step, they basically record uh, the information about the history of the sequence uh, in, a, in a state vector, as we call it. So they, they keep track uh, the, the state of the sequence. So for instance, given a carbon, they first record that there was a carbon, and then they, they update their information, uh, update their knowledge that, okay, there, there, there is now a nitrogen, there is now another token, and then just they keep doing that for all molecules until the end. Uh, until uh, the the information is actually compressed uh, into one uh, single uh, vector. This is actually a very efficient uh, way of doing it because if you have this stateful uh, representation, then you can also generate very fast with it. As, as if you are learning, you're, you can just generate one by one. But uh, it might also be the case that if if the uh, if the information in your previous uh, tokens is is just too much. Uh, to fit into that uh, vector, then uh, some information might basically slip away. So yeah, there might be, so you actually introduce a, a, a information bottleneck in this sense. That might be enough, not be enough, that, that's really task dependent. An alternative architecture that has been again very popular for chemical language models is generative pre-trained pre transformers. And they do something fundamentally different from LSTMs. Given a smiles input, GPTs or transformers in general, they can actually process the entire input uh, at once. And then given this entire input, they actually learn all pair relationship between each tokens. And then they, they actually, uh, and they, they, lot, they let the information flow between any pair of token uh, without uh, any risk of information loss, let's say. So they're in, the, in that sense, very effective uh, to, uh, to, to capture the uh, global information in the sequence. But when it comes to generation, this uh, idea uh, comes at a quite high computational cost. It's actually more costly compared to LSTMs to generate with GPTs. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and to summarize basically what, yeah, what the, the relative shortcomings of uh, those models with respect to each other, GPTs, they can uh, be better in capturing global pro properties than LSTMs. There are also some studies uh, uh, suggesting that. And LSTMs, they're actually uh, faster uh, to design uh, new molecules or explore the chemical space than GPTs. But 
Uh, can it be the case that uh, we we can actually somehow combine the best of two worlds? Because we know that they're actually both very good models. They are they are, they have been working uh, pretty well. But so can we actually combine the best of two worlds here? And enter structure state space sequence models. Okay, as four models, they're they're, uh, they're different from LSTMs and GPTs. They can be uh, considered as an alternative uh, to LSTMs and GPTs, and they have been proposed in like one and a half year ago, uh, and has has made quite a splash. Uh, they're inspired by those state space equations that has been well studied in signal processing and control engineering for uh, for decades. Uh, let's say. And they, they can also map inputs to outputs. So they're also uh, sequence models, actually. So given an input UK, they first transform this input via matrix B and then combine it with a hidden state, very similar to LSTMs, uh, to compute the next hidden state. And then using this hidden state and the input again, uh, so the matrices C and D, they, they produce an output. So they map the input to an output via uh, uh, A, B, C, D parameters that can all be learnable, and therefore they're actually sequence models. And if you actually plot the uh, computation graph for this equation, we, we see that it's actually very similar uh, to the LSTM on, on how they can, uh, for instance, generate. So they can do this stateful generation uh, via this uh, two, uh, two equation system. The cool thing with uh, this state space, uh, that, that state space system uh, is that they can also be reformulated as a convolution. So using the exact same parameters that, uh, yeah, that formulated the uh, state spaces, A, B, C, and D optionally, you can actually uh, compute a convolution. So this is without any information loss, without any uh, trick, let's say you can actually formulate the recurrence uh, as a convolution. And this opens up some other uh, uh, opportunities, uh, such as being able to uh, process the entire input at once. Yeah, first, this is fast uh, to train uh, compared to LSTMs. And it might also uh, allow a global look uh, at the input, which might help capturing those global uh, properties that uh, LSTM might actually struggle. So in short, OK. An error occur. Do you see my screen? Okay. Yeah. He's back now. Okay. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay, sorry. I, it just an error occurred, and then yeah, I don't know what. Anyways, so yeah, as far as uh, they they can be uh, formulated as uh, convolution. And, and the recurrence uh, with the same set of parameters. Uh, uh, yeah, with the same set of parameters. So in that sense, they have this dual formulation. And given this dual formulation, they, they might actually uh, make the be be best of uh, both work because thanks to the, this global uh, learning of global processing of the inputs, they might actually be able to learn uh, global properties better. And thanks to the recurrent generation, they might still uh, do very fast uh, de novo direct design. And this architecture with a lot of additional linear algebra uh, to make this whole thing work has been very impactful in the broad uh, field of deep learning. It, it has been shown that uh, this, uh, this S4 architecture, it's very good at uh, 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 generating new text, new image, and new audio, so data of different modalities. And of course, uh, here, uh, motivated by all this uh, dual formulation and all the success uh, in other domain, we ask the following questions. Can S4 uh, also design molecules uh, somehow better than uh, the state of the art? Okay, in, in, in some aspects. And I see you have raised your hand, uh, Prudence, you? Yes, yes, I have a small yeah. question. So yeah. just to make sure I understand, is the ability to learn from the global structure of the molecule just mm -hmm. come from the dual formulation? If so, how that's implemented? Like, both the dual formulation, like the global learning aspect and the recurrent aspect, is it implemented one at the encoder level and the other at the decoder level, or how is it done exactly? Uh, it 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 uh, so uh, it's it's actually one model and it's a decoder only model, very similar to a GPT, let's say. But the same model, uh, 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 same parameters uh, using the same parameters can be 
formulated either via a convolution, a global convolution over the input, or as a recurrence. So during the training time, for instance, you can feed the input to, a, to the convolutional representation and optimize your uh, system parameters. And then when, when the training is done, you can switch back to the recurrent formulation and then start generating very similar to LSTMs. Is that any clear? Okay. Yeah, it's clear, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And by the way, in general, if there was any clarification question during the talk, please uh, feel free to raise your hand and interrupt me. If there's any discussion uh, triggering questions, I think we can uh, keep it to the end to have a broader uh, discussion. Yep. And then, yeah, let me, uh, yeah. That, and now this brings me uh, to uh, our study here, okay? So in this study, motivated by uh, its performance and its uh, this cool dual formulation, we actually uh, use the structured state space sequence model or S4 in short uh, for molecular, des molecular design tasks. So we first uh, curate a, a, a large collection of molecules from Campbell, 1.9 million, and then uh, learn, uh, train an S4 model uh, on top of it, and then uh, gen, uh, start generating molecules. And of course, when you have these uh, generations, you also need to do evaluation. And uh, we, we ask uh, some main questions uh, for the evaluation. We first ask, okay, the training is done, but can S4 actually design molecules? Can it capture uh, some properties such as bioactivity, which is yeah, one of the important properties in general design. So can S4 uh, actually capture the bioactivity of molecules? And then having captured that can actually uh, rediscover bioactive molecules that are unknown to the uh, model during training time. And then can it, can it also add some diversity uh, to those designs? Because in the end, we don't want the same scaffold uh, a bit different uh, in every single design. We also ideally want some diversity. So we will now, we, I will evaluate the model in, in each of those aspects and try to find the answers. First, can S4 design molecules? So yeah, yeah we, then we trained S4, LSTM, and GPT on the same data set, and we measured three uh, metrics, validity, uniqueness, and novelty. Validity is basically the fraction of the designs that correspond to an actual molecule, whereas uniqueness is the number of unique molecules among, uh, yeah, among the designs. And novelty is, again, the fraction uh, of the uh, molecules unique molecules that are not in the training set. Okay, so we keep filtering and filtering from left to right. Even though those metrics, they're known to have quite some vul uh, vulnerabilities uh, to uh, benchmarks, uh, they're actually like good sanity checks to see if the models are trained properly. And here we see that the models that they actually uh, obtain uh, quite a good result. Uh, S4 is achieving a bit uh, higher in all of those three metrics, but we wouldn't call this as a like very big victory because in the end, validity, uniqueness, and novelty, they don't directly uh, correlate uh, to our main goals, but they're more like good sanity checks. But yes, S4 can design molecules. We can uh, say that uh, after uh, those results. Then more important question, can uh, designing bioactive molecules, now we want to introduce some properties uh, to, 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 the, to the designs. And to do that, we create some additional data from the lit PCBA data set. We create a, a list of binders uh, for five proteins, uh, and each data set uh, comes with different sizes, different number of actives and inactives. Uh, and then we do experiments. And then we, uh, yeah, we first uh, further train our uh, model uh, using those uh, bind uh, binders uh, as, as different fine tuning campaigns, and then uh, measure uh, some metrics. Uh, just as a note, the results for the TP53 data set, it's available on our preprint, but I won't include them here just for the brevity of the presentation. But if you're curious, they're all uh, available in, in the preprint. Okay. Now, uh, yeah, we, 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 had, we have those models, we trained them, we fine-tuned them for uh, bioactivity. Now let's ask the first question. Can S4... Uh, yeah? Just a quick question before you move on. So. In the pre-training model, do you do any kind of uh, sorting of based on like lengths and, and atoms and stuff like that? There's a question in the chat basically asking about that. We yeah we don't we do some filtering uh, of of Campbell, so we include molecules only up to uh, 100 length of, of smiles, but yeah, and we also do some cleaning, removing removal of stereochemistry like desalt, but all all like uh, basic uh, data 
cleaning stuff, let's say. Great, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks uh, for raising the question. Yeah, uh, now having those uh, molecules that are supposed to learn uh, bioactivity, we ask the following question. Can S4 separate actives and inactives? Okay, and to do that, uh, we, yeah, we, we use our held out test set molecules, which contain some actives and inactives. And then we feed those molecules to the S4 and to the other models. And then we ask S4 uh, to actually score those molecules using the log likelihood. If you're unfamiliar uh, with uh, the concept of log likelihood, it is actually, an, it can be treated as an estimate uh, of this molecule being generated uh, by this model. So it can be treated as a, as a proxy to the expected bioactivity uh, by this model. Okay, so this model scores this uh, held out molecules using the log likelihood, and then uh, we use these scores to rank the molecules. So if a model is good at capturing uh, the properties of bioactive molecules, it should also be able to rank the active molecules higher and the inactive molecules lower. So for instance, in this case, the, the molecule at the top and, and at the bottom, they are active, so they should be ranked in the first and the second, whereas the inactive molecule in the middle, they sh it should be ranked as the third one. Okay, so we do a ranking via each chemical language model for all, for all the data sets that we created. And then we, we measure, we, or we, uh, then we count the number of actives uh, or the fraction of actives in the test set that are placed in the top 10, top 50, and top 100, top 100 of the list. So yeah, for, for, for each model across data sets. And here uh, in the plot, uh, the, the, the bar heights, they, uh, yeah, we, we did 10 uh, repeated experiments. And the height of the bar, they correspond to the median across uh, those 10 experiments. And, and the error bars, uh, they, they uh, correspond to the interquartile uh, interquartiles, OK? What we see is that, uh, yeah, uh, the, the blue bar, the, the bar that uh, represents the S4, it actually achieves consistently a higher uh, identified active ratio than the other models. A, a close second in most cases uh, is GPT. And, uh, and LSTM often is the, is the uh, last model. This actually uh, highlights uh, an interesting aspect in the sense that S4 and GPT, which uh, processes the molecules as a whole, so they do this holistic processing, uh, which uh, might help capturing some global properties, uh, they actually shine in capturing, uh, the, uh, capturing a key property uh, of the fine tuning set. So, it, this actually is, a, is an interesting uh, highlight for us. And again, we see that S4 is doing uh, better uh, often uh, across the data sets. And having seen those results, we move on uh, with, with more experiments. And then we, we start exploring the chemical space. So, and what does it mean? We basically uh, generate uh, different molecules using different randomness level. Uh, to control the randomness with those chemical language models, uh, it's uh, temperature, uh, it's, it's a parameter of the generation is often used. And uh, in, in the plot, uh, it, and in this plot, you see temperature on the uh, x-axis. And as like a rule of thumb, uh, the higher the temperature, uh, the more random the designs. So yeah, uh, so if you increase the temperature, the generations will look like more random. And uh, it's expected that the, the validity of the generations will actually drop because you, will, uh, you are taking more risk. Uh, but also diversity of the designs uh, should increase because again, you are, in, you are introducing more randomness uh, to the pipeline. So uh, yeah, uh, again, uh, what we see now, we see that uh, as foreign LSTMs, they, they consistently perform on top. Uh, yeah, one outperforming the other in, yeah, in, in some cases I wouldn't uh, call, uh, yeah, we, we don't see like a clear performance gap. Uh, but we see that they, they manage to uh, yeah, stay on top and they manage to uh, uh, maintain a higher level of uh, design validity. Whereas GPT on the, on the other hand, it, it has actually had a very significant drop uh, in, in terms of validity and it, it's even dropping uh, below 40% uh, in, in all cases. So this is actually, an, again, an interesting uh, highlight because yeah, we were talking about this holistic input processing versus recurrent uh, uh, generation. Here, the recurrent generation using uh, LSTM and S4, it actually it resulted in a higher validity uh, compared to GPT, which is 
basically, yeah, which doesn't track uh, in any states, uh, actually. This is, again, uh, might be an uh, interesting finding. And then we move on because we're generating valid molecules is one thing, but what we really want is uh, to generate bioactive molecules, ideally. And to do that, we compute something called the rediscovery rate. So rediscovery rate is basically the fraction of uh, test set actives that are uh, re re generated or the fraction of yeah, test set actives, held out actives that are also generated uh, by the models with some similarity. So we introduce a similarity threshold uh, to define rediscovery. And here we use a Tanimoto similarity threshold of 60%. So if a model uh, generates a design that is 60% similar to a test set active, we count that test set active as rediscovered, okay? And again, the higher, the better, because we want models uh, to expo uh, to design uh, some, uh, yeah, uh, to explore the related uh, regions of the chemical space related to bioactivity. And what we see here, uh, as far as actually maintaining a, a higher uh, re re rediscovery rate, uh, yeah, it's, uh, and uh, LSTM and GPT, they're uh, often uh, a bit uh, below. And this is actually a very uh, interesting task in the sense that uh, it, it is a design task. So it, it requires the model uh, to be able to uh, design well, but it also requires the model to learn the properties uh, of the chemical space well, because in then it's not generating any molecule, but it, it's generating molecules with somehow uh, bioactivity or related to bioactivity, let's say. And then as the last uh, evaluation uh, metric of this part, we, uh, we evaluate the diversity uh, of the molecules because yeah, we want to have diverse uh, scaffolds, let's say. And to do that, uh, we measure uh, the number of uh, scaffold clusters uh, in the design, again, across temperature. We expect the number of uh, scaffold clusters to increase uh, uh, at some, uh, until a point because yeah, you increase the randomness uh, with increasing temperature. But at some point, it, uh, temperature becomes a bit too high and the generations become uh, they, uh, start to become invalid. And then the number of clusters might, might actually drop. And this is also what we observe uh, in the plot. We see that, uh, again, a design task, uh, a GPTs and, uh, sorry, as far as LSTMs, they're uh, obtaining higher number of scaffold clusters, whereas uh, GPT is falling behind. And we see that uh, in, in, especially in two of the data sets, uh, LSTMs are actually generating more scaffold clusters, uh, more unique scaffold clusters uh, than, uh, than S4. But here I would uh, take that uh, with a pinch of salt because uh, again, the main task is to generate molecules with uh, bioactivity here. So it's not about generating any diverse scaffold, but uh, yeah, generating scaffolds with somehow promising bioactivity. So in that sense, there is a trade-off here because the uh, yeah the more you often push for diversity, the risk is that you would uh, lose uh, some in terms of bioactivity, and I think here uh, the the important part is to uh, yeah uh, follow a trade-off, and I think each model is uh, you uh, it it has their own uh, trade-off signatures, let's say, and it depends on what you want to use. I would say for generating bioactivity, as for uh, is actually uh, might uh, be looking more promising. But with that, with S4, yeah, if you are just generating diverse molecules, yeah, that might be better actually. Okay, yeah, then uh, the other question, because we, we, we have spoken about this uh, speed uh, component <coughs> uh, of models, you know, uh, during training time, that, during generation. Yeah. Can I interrupt you a bit? Sure. Uh, so going back to the previous slide, when you were presenting the result, uh, um, how well the model kind of, you use the likelihood to predict if a model is able to generate active or inactive compound. Have you compared to just using a random classifier on, uh, not the random, a classifier trained on the data that know which molecule are active and inactive? No, no, we didn't uh, do any comparison uh, with, a, with a classifier, no. Okay, and because I first, the, I'm asking because the uh, accuracy is quite low for some tasks, and I was wondering if the tasks are inherently difficult or if generally it's not a good idea to use this generative so, model as a way to separate active and inactive molecules. So here, uh, the, the y-axis, uh, I wouldn't call it as an indi indication of accuracy 
because it, it's, it's more like a recall, actually. It quantifies how much of the test set is, is placed in the top 10, top 50, or top 100. So it's more similar to recall than accuracy. Yeah, and, and for instance, if you have an identify active ratio of, I don't know, 10%, it means that 10% of the test set is in the top 10 list, for instance. So it, it doesn't really translate immediately to the accuracy. If, okay, if you want to use this as a, a classifier, then you might do some additional trick like threshold tuning and whatsoever. And then uh, I, I don't know what the results would look like. So I cannot say it's a very good idea uh, to use this as a classifier, but I also cannot say it's a bad idea. Okay, so perfect. Thank you. Uh, there's a question in the chat um, from Matt. I don't know if you can see the chat or I can read it. It would be better if you can read it because I have a bit of yeah. a mess screen. <laughs> so the, the sorry, the, the question is about the rediscovery threshold uh, of 0.6. Uh, it seems that maybe a bit low. Do you know how that compares to the similarity between like the test set actives and the train set actives? Uh, I have a plot uh, of those actives, but not using Tanimoto. Uh, but yeah, we, we also experimented with different thresholds, by the way. And yeah, we, we basically computed the same uh, rate using, yeah, 0 0.4, 6, 8, 1. So yeah, I can in general say that uh, uh, a full discovery is very rare. And it's, I would say it's also expected to be rare because we generate only 10,000 designs per target. And yeah, the design space is huge uh, when you have molecules of up to 100 a token, let's say, and exact rediscovery is very rare for all the models. That's why we introduced the threshold. But of course, you can be more stringent with it. You can be more tolerant with it. It's it's just a parameter. Thank you. Yeah. But I think sixty percent is often like treated as is like like a threshold uh, to say something is novel or not. So yeah, that was yeah. But, all those numbers, I would say, yeah, they're very much open to negotiation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, then uh, yeah, we have been discussing this uh, speed component uh, of GPTs and LSTMs, and yeah, of course, the same question definitely holds for uh, S four two. Is it actually fast? Because in the end, yeah, people want to use it. Like, uh, so yeah, we we have done some experiments of yeah training models of smiles length uh, up to four uh, hundred, let's say, and what we have. Uh, observe is that S4 and GPT, they often go hand in hand uh, in terms of training speed. So they're, they're, they are faster than LSTMs, uh, yeah, which are a bit slower. But when it comes to generation, we have with GPTs as, as expected, you see this quadratic uh, growth uh, with the, with the smiles length. So it, it doesn't scale very well uh, uh, compared to uh, S4 and LSTM. And S4 and LSTM, yeah, they're uh, on par. S4 is a bit faster. But yeah, here, something to mention is that as far as here implemented in PyTorch, LSTM and GPT, they're implemented in uh, TensorFlow and Keras. So the exact values might actually differ based on implementation. And yeah, all models are open to uh, optimization, let's say. But this uh, quadratic pattern and, and the linear pattern, it's, it's yeah more there to stay unless you do some additional tricks uh, to the GPT. Okay, but yeah. The, the bottom line is, yeah, S4 is definitely very much usable uh, for large larger uh, molecules as well. And then, yeah, we, we actually use it uh, for larger molecules. Uh, we, we, uh, we now uh, move to a new task. We, are, we, we leave the bioactive molecule design uh, behind and we start uh, with a new task. It's called natural product design. Natural products, they're actually very, uh, they're a very interesting family of molecules. Uh, at some point between 1981 and two, 2014, like half of the uh, approved drugs were either a natural product or natural product inspired molecules. And, and then yeah, natural products, they're often characterized with, uh, by this high structural diversity with some good uh, pharmacological properties and, and, uh, and also having very challenging, being very challenging uh, for chemical language models, because again, they tend to contain a larger, uh, uh, higher number of heavy atoms. In, in this, uh, yeah, in this case, they uh, they contain up to uh, 450 uh, smiles tokens, so they are larger, longer sequences. 
uh, and then they have this uh, uh, very interesting, uh, let's say, uh, macro cycles that, that actually make them uh, challenging for uh, generative deep learning uh, models. So uh, we use the same pipeline uh, for natural product design, but we change the data set. Uh, we use the coconut data set, uh, which contains 32K molecules, so much smaller than Campbell. And we only use the molecules in coconut that are uh, uh, of length uh, between 100 and 450. So only the uh, large, uh, longer sequences, let's say. And then having trained the models, uh, we again generate the 100,000K uh, generations. Uh, for this syntactic evaluation, and we measured validity, uniqueness, and novelty again as a sanity check. We see that, yeah, as for an LSTM, that yeah, as, as for it has a bit higher validity and uniqueness, but when it comes to novelty, LSTM and GPT is yeah is achieving a bit higher novelty. But again, uh, I I really see those metrics as more like sanity checks rather than uh, uh, yeah a very uh, precise uh, evaluation metric. We also comp uh, so yeah. Uh, and I would say, yeah, they can all design natural products, even though the performance is lowered compared to small molecule design, which is somehow expected given the smaller data set size and longer sequence length. So we also computed a natural product likeness or NP likeness in short to evaluate the properties of those molecules generated by the models. And NP likeness, it actually quantifies the structural similarity of the designs to the known natural product. So it, it does like a database lookup in terms of uh, substructures, okay? And uh, yeah, this metric, uh, uh, yeah, uh, shown that S4 can actually uh, uh, design more natural product-like uh, molecules uh, based on those uh, substructures. And yeah, this difference is significantly higher, uh, yeah, let's say statistically, let's say, okay? And then we computed some additional descriptors that are known to be important uh, for natural products, which are number of sp3 carbons, number of spiral atoms, spiral atoms. They are, uh, yeah, they are the atoms that are shared between two rings, uh, which share only one atom. So two rings that share only one atom, then it's called a spiral atom. And we also, yeah, computed number of heavy atoms. Again, all important properties for natural products. And then we computed. Uh, the kolmogorov of distance between the uh, test set uh, properties and the design properties, okay? So we did this distribution distance-based analysis, and we see that S4 is actually achieving uh, less, uh, dis uh, so less uh, distance or better results compared to other models. And GPT is the second uh, best uh, for, for those three descriptors. And this actually, again, uh, might come back uh, to our previous discussion that, yeah, when it comes to generating molecules with some specific global properties or yeah, with specific properties, let's say, S4 and GPT yeah, might really be uh, better. Okay, yeah, and then having been inspired by all those results on small molecules and uh, natural products, we did a prospective study and in silico prospective study using molecular dynamic simulations. And this part, uh, uh, it's, it's done, uh, largely uh, by my co-author Emanuele, who's, yeah, who's an expert on molecular dynamics and who's coming from a chemistry background. Okay, so yeah, what we did, we, we selected a protein, MAPK1, okay? And then we created uh, six to eight inhibitors from Campbell from, uh, for this molecule using a yeah, threshold of uh, 1,000 nanomo uh, nanomolar. And then uh, we fine-tuned an S4 model that was pre-trained on Campbell. So we are back to the uh, uh, small molecules, drug-like molecules world. And then we designed and ranked uh, our designs, okay? In the end, uh, we selected uh, 10 designs. Uh, so here, the molecules that you see from one to 10, they are designed by the S4 model. And then we also uh, identified their nearest active in the training set. So molecules that you see from 11 to 16, they're actually known active. So those are the uh, structures uh, that we analyzed. And then what we did, we have uh, run molecular dynamic simulations for all those molecules, for the designs and also for the actives to be able to have uh, some control. We have used umbrella sampling. We yeah, we have uh, run the experiments for one molecule and one replication for 500 nanoseconds. So yeah, and then we did uh, three repeats for uh, to measure one delta G value. So one result uh, of the molecular dynamics, we did three repetitions. 
and delta G, if you're unfamiliar with it, the lower, the better metric. And uh, yeah, and I think as said in the literature, if your delta G is below minus nine, then there is there is a, a chance that yeah, there's a higher chance that the the molecule will actually uh, be bioactive or will bind to the protein. Okay, and what we have seen in those uh, ten designs, eight of them actually had delta G values lower than minus nine. So this means that eight out of 10 might actually indeed bind uh, to the protein. So we are fulfilling the, uh, our main goal. And what we have also seen in some cases is that the delta G of the design is actually lower than the delta G of the nearest active. Uh, and here we define uh, similarity to the active as uh, scaffold similarity. Okay, so yeah, highest scaffold similarity, let's say. And yeah, in, in some cases, designs really had lower delta G values uh, than the nearest active, and that's actually uh, very, very promising. And then what we did, we also uh, yeah uh, uh, predicted the binding poses for some of the designs and their uh, yeah uh, actives. For instance, for the active three and for, uh, for sorry for the design three and its nearest active molecule thirteen. Uh, yeah, we, we, we predicted this a uh, binding pose. And yeah, if you look at the structure, you see that yeah, there is a, the, the biggest uh, edits uh, from the nearest active to the design is that it has, yeah, the design has a different uh, head on the uh, left-hand side. Okay, so, yeah, that's the largest uh, edit. And then, yeah, a, a, another interesting case where again, the design has had a lower or more promising delta G than its nearest active. Uh, again, uh, we, we see a replacement uh, of the head uh, on, on the left hand side. And yeah, here on the right, you see the uh, predicted uh, binding pose. I want to make a, any like elaborate uh, comment on the on the chemistry behind it because I'm a computer scientist uh, myself. So yeah, uh, yeah, I, I will I will keep my uh, chemistry comments uh, to myself yeah. in, a, in a recorded talk for sure. Yeah. And yeah, so in short, uh, so as for uh, it's actually a novel method for molecule design. As far as we know, we are the first group who have used S4 for molecule design. And we have actually seen that it can capture molecular property distributions very well. It can capture those global properties quite well. And it can also explore the chemical space. So effectively and efficiently. So it's, it's fast when it comes to generation and it can actually design molecules with uh, bespoke properties. And then it, it designs molecules with promising bioactivity as uh, shown by the molecular dynamic simulations. But are those all enough to say that S4 is now the best model out there for the novel design? Of course not, uh, yeah, because I, transformers hasn't become transformers in one day for natural language. You know, it, it takes much longer and much more research uh, to actually validate or invalidate a model. So we open source our code base as easily as possible to use. So in just four lines, you can just uh, pre-train your own S4 on your own data and then fine tune it uh, using transfer learning for any property. And if you do do if you do that, please let us know and yeah, let us know how it goes. And then yeah, we will also have a better idea of how S4 is performing in, in different applications. And when it comes to the outlook, yeah. The tasks, uh, they're endless in drug discovery. So I would say uh, the immediate application uh, would be applying S4 uh, on a different task in drug discovery and also going to the lab, maybe with those promising designs and uh, get the actual crystal structures even uh, to see if, if there is an, yeah, if there's binding and to get the assays. And of course, maybe to expand the other molecules because S4, even though I didn't go into details, it's actually proposed for those very long sequences that are way longer than 400 or yeah, one or yeah, 400 C, uh, tokens. Yeah, it, it can easily go up to 32K or yeah, even longer in some applications. So yeah, why not use those as for, for larger molecules like proteins or polymers and whatsoever. Yeah, uh, I thank uh, all of my uh, co-authors and all of my group. Again, we, we did all, all, all of this study uh, under the supervision of Francesca Garizoni. And uh, Sarah, she was a bachelor student who actually uh, started this project. She was a very impressive bachelor student, and yeah, and then we followed up. And Emanuele, he has uh, done all these MD simulations, and yeah, he contributed there uh, mostly. So yeah, uh, thanks uh, for your time. If you're interested in the preprint or using our code base, here's, here's our QR code. 
If you also just Google chemical language modeling with structured state spaces, I bet Chem Archive will uh, lead you to the right link. If you have anything to say to me, yeah, feel free to contact me for really anything uh, yeah, on, on this email. And yeah, thanks again for your time. Ooh. Uh, thank you for your talk. If there's any questions from the audience, feel free to unmute, raise your hand, uh, type in the chat, I can read it out loud. Um, in the meantime, I do have a question. Yeah. So uh, I guess you, you know, create these training sets and test sets. Um, have you considered like having any structures in them in the sense of like uh, something else in IID, right? There's been some research recently about what it means for models to generalize out of distribution, what are distributions in chemical space? Have you thought about the, these problems and how models like S4 might, might generalize there? Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't uh, done any uh, out of distribution uh, checks uh, for S4. But but I, I actually find it very interesting because often uh, fitting uh, uh, the properties of a space that that might also come at the cost of generalizability, you know, because yeah, sometimes better fit might actually hamper uh, generalizability. So, it, but maybe if if there is a latent uh, relationship or deeper relationship uh, there, yeah, may, may, and that might also allow the model to generalize. So I don't again have an answer. I haven't done any experiments on that. The, the splits that we have used, they were done using random splitting. So yeah, uh, so I don't have any a concrete like numbers for out of distribution generalization performance of those models. And I think when it comes to those generative models, it's yeah, for, for classifiers, it's already very uh, tricky to do that. And when it comes to generative models, it's even trickier, uh, I bet, yeah. Yeah. For sure, I guess you have. Uh, I mean, you know, you were you were measuring things like the test set rankings and all that. Uh, I guess you could do something like that, but yeah. it would be even harder. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't see any questions from? Oh, there is a hand from Prudencio. Yes. Uh, thanks, Elisa, for the for the great talk. Uh, really enjoyed. Um. Have you looked into like in the last slide uh, of the part where you were talking about natural pro um, product? Have you actually validated some of the this new molecule in the lab outside of just computing the data G? No, no. So so for 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 this part, right? No, no. Yes. We haven't had a chance uh, to go to the lab uh, with. with yeah, with those molecules or with some other molecules, but it's it's definitely something we have in our mind because MD results uh, we think uh, are actually very promising and some of the designs they yeah they, they actually look like synthesizable. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, we we we'll see how that part goes. Let's say. Okay, cool. And yeah, the the other thing that also a problem with most of the this um, molecular generator is the synthesizability. And yeah. yeah, how any thought on how to make the S4 incorporate criteria for synthesizability and make sure that the, the model that the molecule that generated are easily uh, accessible uh, for chemists? Uh, yeah, we haven't done any modification to the models to ensure that, but we measured like two common synthetic ac accessibility scores, like SA score and, and static complexity SC score. So they're both lower better metrics. Uh, we, we compared models uh, like, yeah, across fine tuning experiments for uh, drug like molecules. And yeah, I think if you look at the box plots uh, on the screen, yeah, they all behave similarly. And like the overall range, it's actually uh, in the desired uh, range uh, according to literature. But of course, if you look for one specific design, yeah, things uh, might be uh, more challenging. For instance, uh, we actually had a very uh, interesting case here. For instance, if you look at design two, it has a very long arm uh, at, at top. So yeah, for instance, this would probably uh, be very hard to synthesize, but the other molecules, uh, yeah, uh, they, they might be uh, way easier uh, compared to design two, yeah. 
Okay, I see. Um, so one last question related to that is often like to make model generate uh, easily accessible um, molecule or synthetic accessible molecule, you often have to introduce the notion of fragmentation. At yeah. least that's what like previous um, previous method or paper did. So any do how can kind of S three uh, sorry S four can um, can behave with this new fragmentation uh, scheme that people have tried in the past? Uh, if if you if you like uh, feed if you don't feed the uh, uh, character by character smiles, but if you feed the fragments, yeah, that would still work out of the box because it will still be a sequence, let's say, but. Uh, it might also come uh, at, a, at a cost of diversity because when you are designing at this atom level, then the then the model is super flexible, right? It can it can generate anything. Yeah, but yeah, I, I see your point. It might also come at a cost of uh, synthetic synthetic accessibility, but I think it's it might be easier uh, to just generate and then filter out uh, the uh, non synthesizable molecules because if there is any yeah because I wouldn't want to miss a promising uh, and really novel uh, molecule uh, be beforehand, so, yeah. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yeah. Miruna, go ahead. Um, yeah, hello. Um, hello. So I have a question about the way you define the rediscovery rate. So, um, you basically measure or quantify bioactivity based on similarity to, to the test set. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that's a good enough measure because um, structure is not necessarily indicative of activity. And yeah. very often you have this concept of activity cliffs where there's a pair of very similar molecules that behave very differently. Exactly. And exactly. I'm uh, just wondering if you're also skeptical of this. Uh, Metric. Yeah, I, I am. I'm very skeptical of this. Uh, if, if anyone uh, finds out a very good method uh, to predict the bioactivity of a design, I would be very happy. Uh, but yeah, we, we have really gone over many, many, many uh, approaches uh, 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 to, to compute rediscovery rate. Uh, yeah, an, an approximate rediscovery rate, let's say, and they all come uh, at some cost. The reason that we have chosen this uh, yeah, initially we have actually chosen something based on string similarity because yeah, this was like a string uh, based model, but then we said, okay, maybe let's actually focus on the structures. Uh, like, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, the structural similarity. And the reason we have chosen this is that even though there are activity cliffs, if a model is exploring the regions related to uh, the, uh, by, uh, the substructures that are related to by activity, it might uh, be exploring the correct regions, even though there are a lot of exceptions or there might be a lot of exceptions, it has still learned uh, uh, learned some properties of the chemical space, again, that relate to bioactivity. I see that there is, there is definitely another one-to-one -one correlation between structural similarity and, and bioactivity, but it still tells you something. And in, in, in that sense, uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is an approximate metric. That's why I, I actually like this analysis way more, like ranking the actives and inactives, because this is very concrete. Here, you know what is an active, what is an inactive. And if a model is good at uh, ranking actives higher than inactives, you actually know that uh, it can capture by activity uh, and yeah, and just uh, filter out to uh, uh, inactives. Yeah, and I also appreciated that you have this molecular dynamics part of the work where you actually quantify binding to the, the binding to the target, yep. which is cool because that can be a, a good indication of bioactivity. Yeah, right? thank, thanks, thanks, thanks. I I I totally agree. I, I think this is uh, this is definitely more convincing uh, than the rediscovery rate analysis. The sad part is this takes so much time. So like those experiments. Uh, yeah, Emanuele has run those experiments, but it, they have really taken weeks because for, for each yeah, design and the active, we have done at least three experiments and each experiment takes, yeah, sometimes weeks. Uh, so yeah, it's, 
it, this, this yeah unfortunately this doesn't this doesn't scale up but yeah it was very good uh, to validate by activity in a case study let's say thanks for the nice words um we might have one last question if we have time um just wondering if uh i mean you know presumably s4s can like capture global patterns i'm not uh, I, i'm easily convinced of that but i'm wondering if that's something we can actually measure uh, i don't know if you have thoughts on that yeah uh yeah uh uh I have uh, I have some data on that. Let's say, for instance, yeah, it's it's coming from this error analysis. So after pre-training uh, the models on Campbell, yeah, we, we did one hundred designs, right? So and I report and I already talked about the validity, uniqueness, and novelty. But I think what gives more insight uh, is actually the invalid designs. So where do those models struggle? For instance, right. So, what 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 was the reason behind the, that invalid generation? Okay, and and we 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 categorize those source of errors into four: branching, rings, bond assignment, and miscellaneous. Okay, yeah, there again, syntax error. So, for instance, here, branching and rings, they really require them. If if you are familiar with the smile tax, they they really require the model to capture brackets or ring tokens in very sometimes in very distant uh, positions uh, of the sequences, right? And what we see is that, for instance, S4 is struggling way less than LSTM and GPT in, in those categories. But when, when it comes to bond assignment, it's, it's actually uh, the nemesis uh, of S4 uh, in, in this analysis. But bond assignment is, is, is really more local uh, pattern, if you think about it. So I think this, this gives uh, uh, us uh, some intuition that as far as might actually be able to design those distant uh, or yeah somehow global uh, properties better than uh, lstms and gpts or they struggle less 